Okay, well, it looks like we are in a good holding pattern with attendees. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with everyone. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are from where, wherever you're joining us from. Um, my name is Laura LeBur and I'm a marine science educator at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystem Exhibit. Welcome back to the fall series of Career Dives, Live Conversations in Marine Science. If you're new, this series will continue to highlight the career tracks, interests, and projects of our marine science professionals working with the Smithsonian Marine Station and the Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. So like I said before, while you're joining, feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're joining us from. Um, I'd also like to point out that you can use the Q&A box to ask your questions of our guest. The Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen and has the two speech bubbles. We will answer questions throughout, so please feel free to leave your questions for our panelist, Yes Marie, today as they come up. You can submit a question at any time, like I said. There's another educator on in the background to keep track of your questions, and if you see a message in the chat box, it will be coming from them. You're welcome to use the chat box to send us messages and answer questions that we have for you, but your comments are visible only to Smithsonian staff, so please keep them on topic and appropriate. Um, this webinar is gonna be recorded and can be found after the fact on our Facebook and YouTube channel, so for whatever reason you have to pop away, um, it is there in perpetuity, um, or you can email us and we'd be happy to send you the links. So today's program is gonna be about an hour. Um, let me say good morning to a few more because we have some people joining us. So Blake, thanks for joining us from North Carolina. Adam, you're joining us from Ireland. Well, good afternoon to you because I know you're about five hours behind us or ahead of us, sorry. Um, Fiona, welcome. Awesome, so much, so many people from so all over the place. That's so great. Well, today it's my pleasure to introduce um, Yes Marie de la Flor, an intern to fellow turned microbiology technician for the Smithsonian Marine Station in Fort Pierce, Florida. Today, Yes Marie is going to be sharing more about the internship to fellowship program and the microbiology work she does on corals and understanding stony coral tissue loss disease. So it's great to have you join Career Dives. Welcome, Yes Marie. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Laura. I'm excited. Me too. I'm really excited to share your journey and your story here with the Smithsonian. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. We'll go all the way back to a very early Yes Marie. How did you get interested in science and maybe even marine science? Well, uh, let me share my screen with you. Can you see that? I think it's loading. There it goes. Okay. Uh, so um, let me start off just by saying I am from Puerto Rico. Um, I was born there and I grew up here in Florida on the east coast of Florida. Um, I grew up by the beach, uh, 20 minutes away from the beach and just visiting the beach all the time and, um, you know, on vacation visiting uh, Puerto Rico. That's what I would do with my family is uh, hang out at the beach. <laughs> so I've always loved the ocean. Um, however, I didn't necessarily envision myself going down the marine sciences route. I was always passionate about science in school. Um, specifically, however, I was uh, in high school interested in forensic science. Uh, so I, uh, throughout my high school experience, I was um, in the criminal justice program. And um, I loved watching, you know, CSI shows and shows like Bones and um, all those forensic science shows. Uh, so that was where I thought I was going to be going. <laughs> um, so that's like a picture of me um, doing an internship at the 19th Judicial Court uh, for my program. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, but uh, so Finishing up high school, um, I kind of got encouragement from my mom to go more the medical route. And my mom, she's um, a first uh, first generation college graduate from her family, so 
she's been a big inspiration in my education career and just, you know, always moving forward. And um, we, you can say she definitely swayed me towards the more medical route. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's where I thought I was going, uh, um, going into college. That's so awesome that your mom was such an inspiration for you. I know my mom just got her bachelor's degree recently also, and I'm really proud of her. So shout out to moms holding it down. Yeah. Yeah. She was, um, she always persevered through everything and she's like a, the biggest inspiration for me. Um, so well, yeah, I thought, sorry, go ahead. Hopefully she's watching or you could send this to her. Yeah. Hey mom, if you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so yeah, I, I thought I was going to, um, medical school or pre-med for undergrad. Um, but I, you know, I loved going to the beach and um, being in the water and I was actually a swimmer in high school. So um, yeah, that's a picture of me and my swim team. It looks like maybe either someone lost or I don't know, <laughs> our coach was yelling at us. <laughs> that's your listening face. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a good transition. You you studied at Indian River State College or what's commonly called IRSC. Do you want to share a little bit more about that experience and why you chose that school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, IRSC was um, instrumental in my growth in, uh, in undergrad. Uh, I chose IRSC because, you know, it was where home was. And also I started out there in my undergrad as a dual enrollment student. And I got to know a little bit more about the biology program and um, just the opportunity to do that. And also I, I knew that it was um, a very affordable college. Um, so most people don't look to state colleges for their undergrad, um, but for me, it seemed like the best fit for undergrad. And um, I'm really glad that I did it because I, graduated with my bachelor's debt free. So that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> and, um, but in addition to that, it was just, it gave me a well, well-rounded education. I felt, um, prepared, um, in that program for, uh, the opportunities that came along further down. So, yeah. And it's actually, um, uh, number one in the nation with, for the Aspen prize, which is, uh, in affordability and um, also education. So it's a really great school. That's really cool. I think a lot of people undervalue the experience you can get at state colleges. Um, but as you said, you know, you went, it's super affordable and you had a really amazing experience. And I know that you had mentioned to me before that you had some really great mentors. Do you want to share a little bit more about them and how they influenced you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started off at IRSC kind of as a typical student that kind of <clears throat> went to school. I went home, did their homework, and went back to school. That was my first few years. Um, and I wasn't really involved. However, uh, getting a job at the, um, at the library, at uh, one of the campus libraries, I uh, met uh, Kendra Aubrey, which was the librarian there. And she was my supervisor and she was a quirky librarian that was just involved in everything and like always on the go. And um, she was a really um, a big factor in me getting involved in school activities and um, just making connections. Um, so thank you, Kendra, if she's watching, I sent her a link. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, she was really great and encouraged me to do different things. Um, the leadership program at IRSC um, we started a club together called the Health and Self Club, which was um, a club that was um, um, encouraging mental and physical health in uh, students. So in that, I was able awesome. to do some really cool activities like um, uh, the salsa dance classes that I did over there, which was a passion for me. I grew up dancing with my mom and teaching salsa dancing. So that was really fun. <laughs> but yeah, Kendra was a really big um, mentor for me. 
So Kendra inspired you to get more involved in school. And I think that that's a really, that's good advice for people who are in their freshman years or thinking about joining college, because I feel like a lot of us have the tendency to just go to school, come home, maybe hang out with our families, but a really important part of the college experience is getting to network and meet new people and try new things. And I know that we talked about you joining a lot of clubs. So do you want to share that experience? You went like the total 180 from not being involved really that much at all, except for classes to being like in a a bunch of different opportunities. Yeah. So, um, as, uh, so through the science club, which was one of the clubs I was a part of, I was able to be involved in a lot of activities. Um, This is us in the, uh, being involved in the oyster reef protection program. And that was really awesome. Um, The oyster reef was uh, supposed to help with turbidity of the water and just um, oyster settlement. So that was really great. It was hundreds and hundreds of bags that we were like lugging into the water. and also uh, I was able to get involved in beach cleanups. And that was kind of my first introduction into the, or to the Smithsonian, um, because the Smithsonian, as you may know, um, sponsors the beach cleanups. So um, yeah, I was doing it in collaboration with them. And uh, I was also involved in a lot of other community activities, such as the Indian River Lagoon Science Festival, and um, other science festivals in Vero Beach, and also um, uh, Earth, Earth or World Ocean Days, um, which was also sponsored by the Smithsonian, I believe. Yeah, we host that too. Yeah, okay. So um, this is actually a picture of me on the right wearing the Smithsonian shirt, which is kind of like foreshadowing, I guess you'd say. Um, yeah, yeah, they gave us those shirts for volunteering. It was really cool. That's awesome. I know the Indian River Lagoon Science Festival is a really awesome um, event. I We weren't able to have it this year with everything happening uh, with COVID and the restrictions, but I think we're gonna be doing some virtual stuff. So make sure you guys stay tuned for that. Awesome things happening in the next year. Um, but we love having the Science Festival. I think it's a really great way to you know, service the community and get get people really interested in different aspects of science. So I think it's so cool that you got to participate and, and help out with that. Yeah, it was great. Um, a lot of science education in the community, which I think is very important. Um, it was great experiences. So you started working with the Smithsonian by volunteering and get yeah. you like kind of like fringing on like, oh, this exists. But when you were at your undergraduate, you were pre-med, right? Yeah, I was um, still pre-med and still uh, leaning towards medical school. Um, But however, in my undergrad, um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but most undergraduate institutions that are bigger don't have senior projects for undergraduates, um, just because, you know, the large class size Um, And in IRSC, I was actually able to do a senior project. Um, And I did this in collaboration with the USDA. It was the citrus screening project, which was looking at uh, citrus screening disease in citrus and um, uh, looking at the insect that vectors the disease, which is the Asian citrus psyllid. So um, that was a really uh, good experience for me. I did a lot of genome annotation and bioinformatics uh, and learned a lot in that experience. And uh, we worked with one of the biotechnology professors at IRSC, Dr. D'Elia. Um, he was my uh, advisor on this project and that was really great. Um, so yeah, I was introduced to disease pathology, I guess you could say at this point. I think it's really great that you got that experience in your undergrad because I know a lot of the larger schools don't, they just don't have the capability to support like a senior thesis or a senior research project. So the fact that you had smaller class sizes and that you were able to do this research project, but I also think it's funny that you're still pre-med, but now we're into like invasive pests or learning about plant botany or plant biology and botany. But I think a lot of the skills that it looks like you learned are skills that are transferable to like a medical 
you know, sector or job anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And I can get into that a little bit more later down, uh, further down. Okay. But, cool. uh, yeah. So um, through this, my senior project, I was able to attend a lot of conferences and um, do poster presentations and just get that experience in, uh, you know, talking to in that scientific environment and um, just uh, learning to present in general, <laughs> it can be a bit intimidating. Um, but I think just the more you practice it, the more you get used to it, you know? Practice makes progress. And I think the, the easier, it, you know, it, it just gets easier as you do it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So yes, Marie, you mentioned a few of your mentors, but do you wanna talk about some of the other mentors you had during this stage of your life and what were the most valuable lessons that they taught you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in undergrad, I had, you know, Kendra Aubrey, who was instrumental in me just getting involved. And that, that may be the biggest lesson from undergrad is, you know, grades aren't everything. Yes, they're very important, um, but you do want to also make connections, um, get involved, not just in the school, but also in the community. Um, so that was very, very, uh, a very good lesson for me. Um, Dr. Delia was also very important in me just getting those um, uh, scientific techniques, lab techniques, and um, uh, just having that inquisitive mind and uh, the scientific process. So yeah, and um, in addition to my uh, professor mentors, I also had a lot of peers around me that um, just were very encouraging and um, we kind of relied on each other <laughs> during like the hard times. So uh, yeah, these were some of the people that um, I've made lifelong friendships with actually. And we still to this day, just encourage each other to you know, keep moving forward and uh, keep progressing. And that's really important to me is just having that support system. Um, you know, uh, imposter sy syndrome creeps in sometimes and you don't really know if you're doing enough, but having people around you that support you and encourage you is, is really great. That's really good advice. I think sometimes, you know, we can have professional mentors, but I don't, you know, peers can definitely be mentors. And I totally know what you mean about the imposter syndrome. When you build a strong community for yourself and you have a network of people who can support you when you feel like you don't belong or you've never, you haven't done enough, um, you know, that's, I think really, really important, especially as a woman in STEM to have like a really strong network of people who can support you. Yeah, absolutely. I love these pictures also, by the way, of you in the this is what a scientist looks like t-shirt. Uh, what a photo shoot. I know, right? <laughs> that was our scientist moment. Yes. <laughs> I love uh, it. We love those shirts. Yeah. I need to get one. Um, <laughs> so what are, your, what are some skills? So you're almost finishing your undergraduate degree here. What are some key skills that you gain from your education and that you think that like every um, aspiring scientist might want to have? Um, you said key skills. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, like I said before, um, in undergrad, the biggest lesson was to make those connections and, um, and just to, you know, reach out, reach out to um, your professors, get to know them. Um, I think connections is very important and networking is very important. And also just having people around you that um, can help you in that way is good too. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I think that's really good advice. So, um, this is uh, graduation coming along. <laughs> um, we were, uh, yeah, this was like the goodbye to undergraduate and it was bittersweet, but um, I learned a lot and I was super grateful for uh, my experiences at IRSC. Um, at this point though, I had, you know, I, I had done a, like a week long shadowing uh, of a doctor. <laughs> And I kind of realized that 
I don't think this is what I want to go do. <laughs> but um, I graduated and I was super proud of um, what I had accomplished. Um, but I was also trying to figure out what my next move was. Yeah, I think we've all been there. After you finish your degree, it's like you want to take the time to really celebrate, but then you know you're like, well, what am I going to do next? Am I going to go into an internship? Am I going to take some time and travel? Am I going to go straight into getting another degree? Or you know, what am I? What am I going to do? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you had a really interesting opportunity. So I'm, I imagine that our viewers are curious to know how you got to the Smithsonian. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about how you started as a volunteer and then you transitioned to the intern to fellow to microbiology technician for SMS? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so through, through a peer, I um, found out about an opportunity at the Smithsonian Marine Station. And um, I wasn't really sure about it. You know, I was, I was like, I don't know, this, is, this isn't what I thought I was gonna go into, but I, you know, I knew that I didn't wanna do med school. So I just took the opportunity and um, I was a volunteer for about two weeks and my, uh, my um, supervisor, Blake Ushijima, um, or advisor, um, he told me about the internship opportunity and um, asked me if I wanted to intern. So I started off as an intern for about a month and then he introduced me to the internship to fellowship program, which was a year long program that um, I can get into a little bit later. Yeah, but, uh, let's talk about that more in a minute, but I'm sure that everyone watching wants to know what the heck is on your slide here. Yes. <laughs> um, so just to tell you a little bit about what we do at SMS, I am in the Coral Health and Marine Probiotics Laboratory. Um, I'm a microbiologist technician now, but um, on this project, we look at a coral disease called stony coral tissue loss disease. And um, primarily we work with uh, a beneficial bacteria called probiotics, um, which are, I guess you could describe as good bacteria. And we work on isolating um, these good bacteria from corals, from their coral, from the coral mucus. And so uh, down here, this is kind of a video of um, a nutrient rich auger medium that we use to grow up the bacteria. And from here we can isolate and purify a specific strain. And then we can test it against um, possible pathogens of this disease, the coral, uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. And so that's this assay over here. And so um, in this assay, you can kind of see it. I don't know if the picture is good quality on your screen, but um, these um, clear zones right here indicate um, inhibitory activity against uh, the pathogen, the pathogenic lawn of bacteria. And once we can find a strain that has those properties, we can then test it on uh, live coral in aquaculture. And that's what you're doing in that bottom picture, yeah. right? Yeah, that's what we're doing here and we're doing here and here. <laughs> That's so interesting. So for those of you who don't know much about microbiology, yes, Marie is basically a bacteria farmer. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, growing the good bacteria and isolating the, the different types that can help the corals either revert or you know stay healthy from the disease or to fight off the bad bacteria that cause the tissue loss disease. Um, so I think it's a really interesting, you're doing all of the, the groundwork by growing the bacteria, separating and isolating them, and then helping with the experiments that are trying to understand what are the, the good bacteria and what are the best bacteria for fighting off these uh, infections. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm also involved in, um, in experiments on deployment methods, which, are these pictures up here. Um, this is kind of the beginning stages where we were <laughs> testing uh, different personal lubricants as a medium to mix the probiotics with and 
have kind of like a paste that we can put on the corals in the field. Uh, so we moved on from that and we moved on to sodium alginate, um, which is what we currently mix the probiotics with. Um, and we have done a few trials uh, using this probiotic paste and uh, it's been uh, pretty successful in sticking to the coral. And um, yeah, it's, it's working. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I guess we'll talk a little bit more about the internship to fellowship project, but I, or um, sorry, portion, but I really just want to mention if you um, guys have any questions for Yes, Marie, as we go along, make sure that you put them in the Q&A and we will ask them as they come up. So I just wanted to remind everybody that that feature is there. We mentioned a lot of interesting scientific things, but if you have a question um, for Yes, Marie about anything, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to them as appropriate. Um, but yes, Marie, do you want to talk about your opportunity for, oh, we have a question. Um, so Max wants to know, do we know the specific pathogen causing stony coral tissue loss disease, or does it depend on the species of coral that's affected? So we have identified a secondary pathogen um, called Vibrio coralyticus, and we know that that's uh, instrumental or that that pathogen when a coral has Vibrio coralyticus, it progresses more rapidly in the disease. However, we don't have evidence that proves that that's the primary pathogen. We think there's another, um, either another co-pathogen or um, something else that would be, oh, my bad, <laughs> that would be uh, causing the disease initially. But, um, some of the pathogens that we use in the lab to test the assays on are Vibrio species. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for the question, Max. Um, you guys, like I said, please feel free to use the Q&A at any time and ask your questions. We'll also take questions at the end. So if you want to hold off and save them, you're welcome to do so, but um, feel free to ask at any time. So yes, Marie, I am dying to know more about this internship to fellowship program. Yeah, uh, so I was super grateful to Blake for introducing me to the program because it was a really great experience and I recommend it to anyone that is interested uh, in not just in marine science, but also just in uh, the Smithsonian museums and learning more about that uh, because it was a museum wide or Smithsonian wide program. So it was me and one other intern down here in DC and then a whole cohort or down here in Fort Pierce and then a whole cohort of interns in DC. And we were participating virtually back in August of last year, which was kind of weird <laughs> at that time. We were just, I don't know how this is gonna work, <laughs> but you know, we uh, participated virtually in uh, the different workshops that they had available for us um, for grant writing or proposal writing um, and uh, resume building workshops, stuff like that. And then a little further into fall, we were actually able to go down to DC or up to DC and uh, meet the cohort and get involved in other activities at the Smithsonian and get to get get a kind of a sneak peek or behind the scenes look at um, curating exhibits and talk to different curators and different um, people at the museums and that was very very cool this is actually at the nmnh natural museum of, um, natural museum of or what is it called national museum natural of history, natural history. <laughs> <laughs> the museum of natural history which was uh, my favorite of course very very cool what a fun experience. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. We also got a look into the archives and just see what they have in collections. And this was very cool. Uh, the name next to it said Clamus Australis, Australis. So I'm guessing it's native of Australia. <laughs> and, um, but it looks like some kind of spiny clam or something. Yeah, it's very cool. How big was it? Um, I would say it was like that big, maybe. Yeah, it was pretty big. And then this just looked like something from a pirate ship or something. I don't know what it was, but it was cool. 
So you get to see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that's not always accessible to the public, which I think is really unique. So we catalog all these different artifacts um, and you can see this big sink here, which is, you know, a huge, looks like a big tridacna or giant clam shell. And you got to go behind the scenes and see all these really cool specimens. Yes, yeah. It was very, very cool. And talking to the curators was interesting as well. And just getting to know like their day, daily activities and how they come up with different exhibit ideas. And yeah, we even got to, um, got to see like future exhibits that they're planning and stuff like that. It was awesome. That's yeah. exciting. And I think what's so cool about the Latino and Pacific Islanders internship to fellowship program is that it's with, with people from all over the Smithsonian institutions, right? So it's not just marine scientists that you're interacting with. It's people from every, every different institution um, throughout. Right, right. So the other interns were in different museums at, or not just museums, but in different aspects of the Smithsonian. Um, so some were in archives, uh, some were in you know, the um, NMNH museum, uh, some were in the art museum. It was very cool. And uh, I was able to kind of connect with them better because it was in person. Yeah. <laughs> I hang out with them and they could, uh, they were able to show me around and visit some of the museums with me. Um, the the um, Black History Museum was awesome. Yeah, it was very cool. So Sharon wants to know what kind of training and workshops did you get to do in the fellowship program? I know you mentioned a little bit about um, your resume building and some of those other experiences, but if you could touch on a couple of the other opportunities that you had too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a uh, resume building workshop, like you just said, and also um, grant proposal writing um, for an independent project, which is what we um, conducted in uh, the fellowship portion of the, of the, of the program. So uh, that was very, very helpful. Um, we had to write a whole proposal for an independent project and, um, and submit it to the program director. Um, so we had to write a grant and all of that. And yeah, it was awesome. Really cool. What an awesome opportunity that you had and like you look so happy in these pictures you can tell that you're having such a great time yeah yeah the people were great the interns are very welcoming you know it, it going into it I was kind of like oh I don't know really we've been virtual this whole time are we going to be able to connect but everyone was really great and we had a lot of fun I think it's so cool that you were like the first round, you know, now it's like such a normal thing to be virtual and we all meet from different places because of COVID, but um, you guys were like one of the first, you know, people to try it. And I, you mentioned that they're going to be taking more applications for 2021, right? Exactly. Yeah. They had to postpone the, this year's cohort experience, but they, as far as I know, they will be continuing it on as soon as the whole world situation uh dies down i guess the restrictions make it kind of difficult especially since some of the museums aren't even open to the public right now exactly yeah but yeah we were the first to uh be involved in this program down here virtually or remotely in uh sms so we were kind of the guinea pigs <laughs> That's but awesome. it was fun and you got to travel up to dc and get to experience the behind the scenes so that's such a unique experience yeah, definitely, definitely. And you finished and now you're still working on the coral health and marine probiotics and you're continuing as a microbiology technician. So you're doing a lot of the things that we talked about before, but what is next for Yasmari? Yeah, so uh, right now I'm a microbiologist technician and I'm continuing on the CHAMP lab uh, in the coral disease project. Um, I've also started working uh, on in another lab, uh, sample or processing samples for COVID-19 and running PCR on those samples. Um, and next, I was introduced to an opportunity by one of the uh, one of the divers here at the Smithsonian, Olivia Carmack. So shout out to her. Um, she told me about the Women Divers Hall of Fame and that they have a lot of grant opportunities. She told me I should apply and I did. And I got 
the grant. I got the Kids Sea Camp Diving Grant Yay. for open water diving. I haven't been able to take advantage of it yet because of COVID, of course, but I'm really looking forward to getting open water diving certification. That would be awesome. And so, just going further and getting more, uh, the advanced certification. And um, I was actually offered to do scientific diving, um, but COVID. <laughs> COVID. Yeah. I know you'll be able to apply all the treatments to the corals after you get certified. That would be so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think that it's this is a cool opportunity. I'm congrats on getting the grant. I know that these are super competitive, but um, if you're, you know, diving can be such an expensive activity. And if you're interested in getting scuba certified and you identify as a woman, you can um, apply for one of the Women Diver Hall of Fame opportunities. They have quite a few scholarship and grants. And I know we've had quite a few of our staff and interns um, receive these opportunities. So I think it's awesome. Yours is gonna cover like the courses and a couple of the gear. Um, some of them are just gear specific. So if you are looking to get um, some scuba diving gear, you can apply for one of those. And I think these, the Beneath the Sea organization is a really great place to start if you're looking to get into scuba and you're wondering like, how can I afford it? Yeah, absolutely. It was a great opportunity. So I'm really grateful for that. And I also get to attend, well, I, I, don't, I guess I don't know if they're gonna have it, but they were supposed to have the Beneath the Sea Expo in October and I was invited to attend that. So we'll see, I guess, <laughs> if they have that. If, if you're interested, um, Aaron, our other educator, put a link in the chat for you. So um, make sure to check that link out if this sounds like something that you'd be interested in. Um, yes, Marie, we have another question from Yasmin who wants to know, how would you advise undergrad students to get involved in exploring difficult science careers during the socially distanced time? Which is a great question, Yasmin. So thank you for asking it. I know that a lot of us are just trying to figure out how to be flexible and to adapt and evolve to the new circumstances. Yeah, I would say my best advice would be to get in contact with institutions around you um, or even professors around you that may know opportunities. Um, I know here we're, I, we're doing virtual interns, right? Yeah, we do have a few. Yeah, so, I mean, you never know what, what opportunities might be available virtually, you know? We might not have thought of something like this being available back before COVID, but you know, we're doing it now. So just get in contact with institutions around you and see what they have available. And I think for us too, you know, we have two in education, we have two um, virtual interns right now. But if you are interested in an internship and they, you know, you go through the application process and they're like, well, we're not able to have people on site right now. If you have any ideas for like how to make that work, I think, um, you know, HR departments and, and hiring people are like interested in hearing suggestions from you. If you can figure out a way to make it work so you can work around some of the, like you don't need to necessarily be on site, but like how are you gonna perform that role um, and make a, good, make a good case. And I think a lot of us are open to hearing suggestions right now because we're also figuring it out, you know? Um, so I just contact them, be flexible and, you know, like I said, if you have creative ideas, like we're, we're down to hear of. Yeah, absolutely. So what is next for Yes, Marie? You're um, finishing up your uh, contract here shortly. Well, I guess you have a couple more months of work, but you're also looking into graduate schools, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's what I'm in the process of doing right now is applying to graduate school. Uh, I'm yeah, looking forward to the next stage. And I really would love to um, continue on in my education. Um, I'm interested and I'm looking for opportunities in disease pathology and host microbe interactions in relation to immune function. So yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now, looking into. Very cool. Well, and any graduate school, of course. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, is there any graduate schools that, you know, programs that were standing out to you or you're just kind of keeping your options open? 
Yeah, um, I have an application deadline coming up actually for University of Florida. So I'm looking forward to submitting that and seeing what happens, yeah. Awesome. Well, best of luck in that and congrats on taking the plunge into doing it. I know that those applications can be ominous and dense. So, um, you know, you have my best wishes. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so my friends, if you have any more questions, we've got a few coming through. <laughs> um, Iris wants to know, um, I know you're a very, a very dedicated young researcher because she sees you at the lab all the time, even late in the evenings. Um, how does Yesmarie organize her day to allow some personal time? Um, and what is your advice to students in regards to time dedicated to pursue a science career, get involved, et cetera? How do you have a work life? What does your work life balance look like? Well, I would say just being aware of, I think being aware of your mental health is super important. Um, you know, if, if you need a mental health day, be sure to, to do that because you can't overwork yourself, you know? Um, as far as prioritizing, just, um, yeah, just making sure that uh, daily tasks are, you know, lined up in priority and um, that would be, what I would do daily and just um, taking time for yourself is very important, you know, for um, mental health reasons, physical reasons. I mean, it, it all, it's all connected, so. That's a great question and great advice. And if you need to have a salsa break midday, <laughs> you're the go-to gal for that. Bust a move in the middle of an experiment. <laughs> I mean, hey, if you're waiting for your samples to process, uh, it's a good opportunity to do like a quick little dance break. Waiting for the PCR to finish, just take a quick dance break or stretch it out, exactly. I know, I take breaks where I from the microscope and I just do some stretches. People probably think I'm crazy doing yoga in the lab, but I, you know, you need to move your body sometimes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Jennifer would like to know what program at UF are you applying for? <laughs> <laughs> I'm applying to the microbiology and cell science program. Awesome. Well, my friends, um, if we don't have any more questions, I'll give them maybe a couple seconds where if anyone has any last minute that they want to ask to Yesmarie, um, you can do so. But maybe while we're waiting to see if anyone has any Q&As, um, Yesmarie, do you have any like last final advice that you want to share with the attendees who stuck it out all the way to the end? Yeah, uh, I would say if I could leave you with one last piece of advice, it would be to just seize any opportunity, you know, even if you don't think it's where you're headed or where you thought you'd be, um, just take opportunities when they come your way, because you never know what might pique your passion or your interests. I didn't think that I was going to be in marine sciences, but I really love what I do and I love working in the lab. So I'm very grateful that I did take the opportunity. Yeah, especially, you know, considering you were going to be a pre-med doctor and now you've, <laughs> you've gone all over the place. I know, I know. <laughs> So there's two more quick questions. I think we can answer them. Um, Angela wants to know if you're looking for a master's or a PhD or maybe both. Um, well, the, the UF program is a PhD program. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking into both though. Cool. And then Allison wants to know if you had any interest in going back to researching citrus greening for grad school. <laughs> um, I get, I guess, well, I'm the type of person that likes to keep my options open, you know, as you can see, <laughs> uh, I kind of jumped around, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't immediately disclose anything or uh, say no to anything, you know, I guess it, it would depend on the project specifically what I would be doing. Yeah. Yeah. If the funding's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I've gotten great advice from my mentors and to just as far as picking a program and choosing a, a, a lab and an advisor that is gonna you know, care about you and um, 
just push you to move forward. So it just depends on all of that. And I think we'll take one more question that just came in because I think it's a good one and we've touched on it a couple of times so far, but um, was it challenging to balance work and school with such a tedious educational program for your undergraduate? Was it challenging to balance school with it within with, the biology program? Yeah, with, and with your research and your, I guess, clubs and stuff. Yeah, well, um, I mean, there, there was challenging times. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it goes back to just taking time for yourself and prioritizing is super important. Um, and asking for help when you need it. I think that was a lesson that I had to learn um, in undergraduate as well. I, yeah, I had to, you know, ask for help at times and that was fine. That's good advice. I think we have to sometimes come to that on our own and learn that one the hard way, which is unfortunate, but um, building that community, like you mentioned before, and having that strong network of um, people to support you and make sure that you're taking time and resting when you need to and not burning yourself out is super important in sciences especially. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, my friends, well, we're getting on, on to the hour. So um, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this program, please join us again. Next week, I'll be interviewing Dr. Blake Ushijima, currently an assistant professor in microbiology at UNC Wellington. Um, but we affectionately know him as the king of coral health and marine probiotics at the Smithsonian Marine Station. So if you want to check out some more um, information about microbiology and uh, learn about his journey into coral health, um, please make sure to join us next week. That's December 17th. And we're going to be popping off again Thursday at noon. So um, we share those links on our Facebook and on our social media. So if you don't already give us a like or a follow, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And you can find us at Smithsonian's Marine Station and Marine Ecosystem Exhibit. Um, we, that will be our final career dives for this year. So, um, but it's not the end of our digital programming. So make sure that you check back next year. We're gonna be starting another lecture series called Marine Science in the Morning. Usually we have this series in person, but we're gonna be transitioning to a digital program and those start January 13th. So again, make sure you're following along on our social media channels and there'll be all the um, events and updates of that. So you won't miss a thing, but, um, Great job. Yes, Marie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was fun. <laughs> if you guys had a question and we didn't get to it, I want to apologize, but please make sure that you know you can email us at any time. Our email address is smseducation at si.edu. Um, it's also in the chat. So if you want to grab that really quickly, if you had a question and we didn't get to it, or if you have any questions for yes, Marie, we can also pass those along. Um, but uh, without, I guess that's going to conclude today, but I hope to see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Bye.